what's up after the Tones Drop family? Dropping in real quick with an exciting update from your favorite podcast. We're wrapping up the first season in the first week of May. I can't even believe it. It is crazy wild how fast this has gone. While we take a short month-long break to gear up for season two, we've got something special lined up for you. We're rolling out four fantastic bonus episodes featuring some of our favorite voices from our past guests. First up, we'll have Jason Warren, the mindfulness medic, who will help soothe your spirit. Then, Kenny Mitchell will take us behind the scenes with Operation Yellow Tape. William Young from Just Corrections will share his insights on the system. And Jess Flores will be gearing up to take us into the next shift with her podcast. Each of these incredible advocates brings a unique perspective to the world of first responder mental health. Stay tuned and keep those vibes positive and let's keep learning and growing together. Thanks for being such an awesome part of this journey. We'll catch you soon with those bonus episodes. I went from being officer of the year to having a very crispy burnout. PTS, severe depression, adrenal fatigue, and suicidal ideation. And I was drowning, and it was either me or the job, and I chose me. I didn't have a label for it until years later. But what I was feeling was my body was just slowly starting to shut down. And I think I had just been high-speed, low-drag for too long. A lot of what I do is educating on ACEs and educating on nervous system regulation and what happens to the brain and the body because I think there's so much empowerment in just being able to understand what your body is doing as a human and that knowing and understanding that everything that you're experiencing after having some chronic stress or having some trauma is totally normal and to be expected. My biggest thing is if you put down the swords, there's no need for the shields. It's the first responder, the first to get the call, the first on scene, greeted by God knows what, pushed beyond the limits that they don't even set. Then what happens? You're listening to After the Tones Drop. We're your hosts. I'm Cinnamon, a first responder trauma therapist. And I'm Erin. I'm a first responder integration coach. Our show brings you stories from real first responders, the tools they've learned, the changes they've made, and the lives they now get to live. And live from Columbus, Ohio, this is your evening news. And my hair even looks newscaster-ish. Now that I accept it moves anchored. when you touch it, it like you can tell the hair is separating. That's because I got ready in 10 minutes. And so therefore it is not exactly like a news anchor. Well, I can tell you, which I say this a lot, but our listeners are going to be getting a real treat today because you got three ADHD women who love to talk about mental health and first responders in one room. But look. For the first time ever, real life, real life, we've got AK with us. Touching each other. Yeah. It's like Charlie's Angels. I know. This is not a green screen. But AK is with us today. If you don't know who AK is, then you better, I don't know, become alive into the world because I know we joke all the time, like people might know you, but it's going to be in this pod, this network of people. And otherwise you're a complete stranger and nobody knows who you are. But I like to, that part. Yeah. We're not trying to be Oprah, right? But I will say... Well, and I could have told somebody else that same thing about Dave Grohl and him singing in the car. And you could have been like, hmm, who's Dave Grohl? I would have keeled over. But again, not everyone knows everyone in every realm. Yeah, but Dave Grohl? Anyway... Say his name, say his name. The point is, and I'm not trying to talk you up, but I really respect you. You? You, one, you can usually watch someone and be like, there are people. Are pe- there are people. You're so much fun. You're passionate. You execute and deliver what is most important, which is cutting through the BS. You talk about the hard stuff. You use your struggles to your advantage to help others and to make a difference and change the culture and the stigma around this crap that's going on with first responders not taking care of their mental health. Yeah. 
And so AK is retired law enforcement. She worked for a sheriff's department here in Ohio. Hence the reason we're together because she is in town to give one of her presentations. You can, is that right? Yeah. You have a speaking it's a, engagement. It's a fit for duty conference tomorrow. Yeah. Nice. Do you get to decide if they're fit for duty? Oh, no. There will, there's no assessments. It is just, it's a wellness day. The Ohio Association of Police Families is putting it on. So there, there will be no assessment. But you've been traveling all around, right? You've been mm-hmm. going all over the place doing these speaking engagements. That's one of the things that you're up to now that you've retired. Now, did you medically retire? No. So I don't even necessarily, I don't feel like I deserve the title of retired. I just say former because I think retired is like when you've actually made it, you've done your full 25 years or whatever. No, I left in 2015. I went from being officer of the year to having a very crispy burnout. I was experiencing PTS, severe depression, adrenal fatigue, and suicidal ideation. And I was just drowning. And it was either me or the job. And I chose me. And it was really hard. I didn't tell anybody why I left. I think I made up some bullshit about going back to further my education, which I did. But it wasn't until months later, and that was not the actual reason for the departure. But now everybody knows why. Yes. Yeah. It took a couple of years for me to have the courage to say that out loud. I am no stranger to hiding in (laughs) academia. But it takes that courage. There's so much more courage in vulnerability and being real and honest and true. Granted, on the job, it takes a lot of courage, too. So I'm not discounting that. But in order to break through this bullshit story about first responders and mental health, that's what it takes. And that's really how I accidentally found you was because you are vocal. You're very vocal on TikTok, on accident, as you <laughs> love to share. That was not her intention, by the way. She was just putting out some real content. And one of the videos that she did was her rap singing the word, not rapping, but <laughs> singing the words to a song, but putting up these little like little pop-ups cutting through the BS. I'm not doing a very good job explaining it. Go to TikTok. Actually, Instagram, because we learned TikTok took the music down. They did. Yeah. TikTok did a, a mass delete of a lot of audios. So it's still on Instagram. But um, no, I was just doing like quick transitions. And the words in the lyrics of the song were so powerful. And it just struck me Um, I believe the song is by Dax and it's called Joker. But I thought, wow, that that applies to the first responder world in so many different ways. And I think that's where my little secret sauce is. I can see everything through the lens of first responder wellness. And I just am able to tie it back and put a slant on it to make it more relatable for first responders. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all just people. We are. But we forget that. I thought you were cyborgs. I, I think some people would like that. Yeah. Cinnamon, what do you have to say? Hi. Unless we're in an x-ray machine. (laughs) Like that was what I immediately thought of that. I think we probably should have a lot more access to x-ray machines to be reminded that when you strip the badge, strip the uniform, we're all the same underneath. And if you're not responding the way a civilian would, It's simply because you've responded enough that you've been able to numb that. And numbing is very different than compartmentalizing, which is the word that I hear so many folks wanting to use to describe what they've done, which is not accurate. Yeah. So when you were describing your experience leading to your departure from law enforcement, you had said burnout, PTS, adrenal fatigue, and suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. A lot of those terms we can say that we're pretty much familiar with. I think sometimes adrenal fatigue, it's not as clear as the other ones. And so if you'd be willing to share your definition of it and perhaps how you were experiencing it as you were making that decision to leave law enforcement and seek another journey for yourself or another path for yourself. Yeah. So interestingly, I didn't even know, I didn't have a label for it until years later. But what I was feeling was 
my body was just slowly starting to shut down. And I think I had just been high speed, low drag for too long. And interestingly, I equate this partially back to some like ADHD and just being like hyper-focused, hyper-vigilant, go, 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 go for too long. And I felt the breakdown happening in my body. I felt the breakdown happening in my immune system. I didn't connect all the dots until later, but I had to have my tonsils taken out at 26 years old. That's not typically normal. I had shingles twice before the time I was 30. Not normal. I had to be rushed to the hospital for severe abdominal pain on duty. Not normal. Now, I did struggle with IBS my entire life, but having flare-ups is a sign of stress. So when I actually left full-time law enforcement, I took about a month off before I started in my criminal court victim advocacy position. And during that time, I slept for about 18 hours a day, every single day for 30 days. And I was so pissed because I had so many things that I wanted to do. And my body was like, no, ma'am, you're going to stay horizontal. You're going to shut your eyeballs and you're going to rest. And it still took, I would say, months before I felt like I was recalibrated. But man, I thought here's something that I warn people about because a lot of times we will see this kind of like restraint collapse after leaving law enforcement because your body all of a sudden is, or first responder world, because your body says, okay, you're safe now. Some of that stress has lifted and you think, oh my God, I'm depressed. I've lost purpose. I need to go back. Mm. And I caution people, that is not what that is. Give it six months. If you got to the point where you made the decision to leave, and I'm not suggesting people jump ship, If you got to that place where you made the decision to leave, do not take those bodily symptoms as a sign that you need to go back. Give it six months. And I'm glad you actually touched on that and the idea of going back because before we had started recording, when we were just mulling, as we discussed, if you listened to our last episode, episode 53 about ADHD, I believe we were talking something about that whole like dopamine hit, that Mm -hmm. whole the, you had discussed with me about the way that that dopamine just hits. And we were talking a little bit more about ADHD and that process. So it's interesting because along with that, there's those adrenaline dumps that all the all of those bodily chemicals are really intoxicating and make you high. And I, I appreciate the fact that often that's why people stay in this work and don't even realize it because they might feel like the way that you were feeling. And really be chasing that high and say, okay, I got to get back into this line of work because I need to get my fix. But really it's quite the opposite. It's learning how to re-regulate your body and your system Mm -hmm. so that you aren't addicted to the drugs, right? To those chemical dumps. Yes. And that's the thing is being able to differentiate because cortisol, the stress hormone feels a lot like dopamine, which is the pleasure center. So you have to be able to differentiate what you're feeling in your body is that arousal, that superhuman strength. It just makes you feel alive. And that's great. But when you're getting that from cortisol, it, it's counterfeit. Mm-hmm. And it's wrecking your body and your brain. And it's just not going to fuel you like you think it is because it's going to make you feel alive, but it's taking years off of your life. Mm-hmm. And I've never said it like that, but I really like That will be in a little quote bubble (laughs) with your little face, a little quote bubble on that. (laughs) But I'm glad that you touched on that. I was just going to say, I think when it comes to the inside pharmacy, we hear so many first responders talk about being adrenaline junkies and it's fun. It's certainly not a stigmatized or negative concept to use. And I'm starting to think about the chicken egg thing. We might think, oh, I like it in my personal life because I like it in my work life. And now I'm starting to question, do we like it in our work life? Because before we became whatever first responder folks are, I was already addicted. And then I found a job where I could keep getting that fix. And then I think I've just started using. And then I'm going out and doing risky things. So I'm realizing that there was a step before the chicken egg that I've 
historically been thinking about. 100%. I think a dysregulated nervous system is going to crave things that dysregulate you. Whatever you are primed and conditioned for is what you're going to seek out. And if you've been primed and conditioned for chaos or excitement, however you want to see it, because the brain doesn't know the difference between fear and excitement. So however you want to condition it, or I'm sorry, label it, if you're primed and conditioned for it, that's what you're going to seek out. And interestingly, we talk about identity a lot in the first responder world. And so to take that a step further, Bessel van der Kolk talks about how the essence of trauma is the loss of identity. And so if you don't know who you are, doesn't it make a ton of sense to go into a field where they hand you your identity via a uniform and a standard operating procedure book? Wow. (laughs) You get a default identity by becoming a first responder. And all of a sudden, you are somebody and you're seen and you're heard and you're validated and then that's where you feel the most alive. And then you come home and you're like, wow, I feel like a nobody. And it just makes your home life feel like trash. Mm -hmm. And you wonder why things don't match up. So then you continue to take more overtime because that feels good. And then your family's pissed off and you don't want to go home and that feels bad. So it just drives you further and further. And it's so hard to recalibrate all of that and balance it back out. Yeah. And that's why we talk a lot about people, even when it just comes to retirement, feeling like I don't even know who I am. Everything has been taken away from me. And now I have to like suddenly figure out who I am. That's a lot of responsibility. Once you've hit that part of life, that should be when you're smooth sailing. And now you're like, I don't even know what I like to do. And you can't get rid of. And I think this is where people get a little bit stuck is because they try to rid themselves of their old identity before they find out who they are. And I think you have to have, you have to have an identity to step into before you can shed the old one. It's not going to lend itself to an actual transition because otherwise you're just going into the ether and not, you know, then you're just floating. So you have to figure out who you are, step into that before you can shed your old identity. Otherwise it's just not going to be sustainable. Yeah. Dang. Again, mic drop moment. I thought we should be just done after that. (laughs) As you're talking, AK, I'm thinking about even what identity means to us and what we think the definition is. And when I ask people who they are, they tell me all of these roles they are in relation to other people. Never have I had someone without prompting or working at it after it's been identified tell me, I'm kind, I'm funny, I'm smart, I am a terrible green thumb, (laughs) whatever it is, it's always, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a wife. And then, God forbid, we've been told we were bad before we ever got into adulthood Because then you give me an everyday hero label and I'm not going to think twice about it. So then when the PTS starts hitting in and we start questioning and feeling delegitimized, there's only one identity to go back to. And it makes that loss even more tragic. I got to say that this whole conversation can go so many different ways, but we all, the three of us kind of knew Like we are from the same cloth. AK walked in my house and I was like, hi, friends. Like, (laughs) how's it going? Good to see you. And I really, if you're okay with it, I would really love to take this opportunity to touch on our conversation when you first got here about this ADHD versus PTSD thing. Yes. Because the listener doesn't know this, but obviously we just recorded the ADHD. We're calling it ADHD mislabeling episode. That was what we were calling it behind the scenes because of this idea that it's all about the hyperactivity. It's this disorder that basically Cinnamon states that the folks that named it ADHD actually don't have it. It's just the things that make them annoyed about us. That's her theory. But what I shared with AK was that we also had a sister episode to the episode about ADHD versus PTSD, which we ended up scrapping for the time being. And a lot of it is based on experience from Save a Warrior, which 
now AK and Cinnamon have both experienced that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cohort number 151. 239. She said she saw the picture and she wondered if that I was did. you. I was like, is that? And that's why I thought that you were a former first responder or, well, yeah. And Aaron was like, no. And I'm like, oh, she's just, she's a unicorn. That means she's in. She's in the club. I'm just walking around with everybody else's shit. Yeah. You're in the club. And my own shit. You're both in the club. Not, she, not to exclude. We, I guess we are qualified. A first responder-ish enough, especially you, that she actually did think that. And it is a unique experience. Obviously, it's not typical that somebody, like, we would go through. But I think what they're learning is that, yeah, we're about just as messed up. And I liken it to like dispatchers where we hear it all. So we're visualizing it all, but we don't actually see it. So we're just constantly holding the space, yeah. ending a session and then rewinding back to zero to be able to take on this new data and never really getting a chance to process it. And so we are experiencing our stuff too. Plus we are adult children of alcoholics. We have high aces. We are recovering alcoholics and addicts ourselves. So it's, we totally fixers, helpers. Yep. God forbid. It's, yeah. It may look very different on the outside, but on the inside, it's just a different version of seeking out the same thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. How can we help and be identified as good people rather than how we've seen ourselves up until then. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. And so I went the long way around. This is what I do to tee up this concept of ADHD versus PTSD, because there is this like questionable thing. How much of it is ADHD and how much of it is a trauma response, which has really flipped our world upside down. And as soon as I mentioned that, you're like, yes, and let me tell you. Oh, yeah. So what is your I've, experience? I've been sitting on this idea for a year and a half or two years, and I haven't said anything because I'm not a clinician and I don't feel qualified to talk about diagnostic criteria and things like that. But here's my thoughts. I'm just going to go for it because I have somebody here that can correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Um <laughs> So in my experience, as somebody who has been diagnosed with PTSD and ADHD, if you were to create a Venn diagram of the two of those things, there are so many things that overlap. There's hardly anything that's going to be in just one category because the ways that both of those things present are so similar, it really makes you wonder. and. When you boil it all down, it all comes back to a dysregulated nervous system. And who's to say that somebody who's been diagnosed with ADHD isn't also meeting the diagnostic criteria for PTSD and just has some trauma that they haven't recognized to be trauma, whether it's in childhood or adolescence. And oftentimes there's a lot of things that we don't recognize because we think of trauma as an event. And sometimes trauma is just the good things that didn't happen or the things that needed to happen to support your upbringing that just didn't occur. And so who is to say that this ADHD diagnosis isn't actually PTS? Because when you start to look at the little bit of the time blindness, rejection sensitivity, reckless behavior, impulsivity, a, a dire desire to connect. So you're sharing your own experiences, which comes off as like you're trying to take the limelight. So many of these things present the same. So which one is it? Is it the chicken or the egg? And are they the same? I know that when you talk about ADHD, it is your, it's neurodivergent, the ADHD. It's neuro, you're neurospicy. But we also have neuroplasticity. Who's to say that the rewiring of PTSD isn't causing the ADHD? Amen, sister. I don't know. And so then when you 
relate that back to first responders. I did a TikTok. I, I think I told you it was a year ago. I think it was two years ago, but it was in April. No, it was a year ago. And I brought it up, ADHD and first responders. And it went viral because people were like me too. And it was unbelievable. Just the idea that like, how, why hasn't this been talked about? I feel like we need to talk about this more. Partially because these things, and I'm really rambling here. No, this, partially because ramble. the things that we struggle with in ADHD and PTSD often on the outside are seen as character flaws. And so we get shamed because we're, we don't have good manners. We're not polite, disrespectful because we're not showing up on time. We're forgetting things. We're not considering other people's feelings. So they show up as character flaws. Like we have bad morals and then we get shamed. And so it just adds to further dysregulation. And then here we are on a podcast talking about it. So which, how excited are you right now, Cinnamon? How, um, (laughs) it's like waiting for it to light up. Just, I'm really working to contain myself. So (laughs) I don't blow over Erin right now because she said something first. AK, I want to direct you towards Gabor Mate, G-A-B-O-R-M-A-T-E. He is the first person that I respected and then very quickly disliked because he said ADHD is not a disorder, not a disease. It is a trauma response. And I was like, fuck you. (laughs) And I took that very personally. And then like you... I've been able to see that Venn diagram of overlapping. And we talk about the changes that happen to the brain with trauma. And then we've always been talking about ADHD as neurodiverse and on the spectrum of autism, right? There is a lot of places across the world that are speaking to it as just one spot on the spectrum. And there are definitely spectrum things that I'm aware that I do. And that had made more sense because the idea of like my brain is wired differently from birth versus by the time I was five, I was so fucked up that I was traumatized and I didn't know how to behave properly and became a people pleaser and was ready with the song and dance whenever I wanted. So for there to sound like a whole bunch of legitimacy around the neurodiversity and the spectrum aspect, and then to have Mr. Mate come in and burst my bubble. And I'm like, okay, so seriously, who did the brain scan of me between the time I was born and I had my first trauma, which I know what I remember as my first trauma. I know that is not the first trauma I had. I also remember my absolute devastation in fourth grade when my oldest sister left for college. And if that wasn't abandonment 101, I was in fourth grade and it showed up immediately like this increased level of hyperactivity and annoyance and desire to keep constant noise so I didn't have to feel isolated and alone. It's a survival strategy. Yeah. I'm working on a certification right now for ADHD as a specialist, and I'm learning so much. We need more Novocaine, and our bodies are processing it faster at a dentist's office. I That's part of not only was the episode, Aaron and I were both at the bottom of the bucket and just, it was a terrible recording, but it truly was like we needed to take a time out. And we need to be responsible educators and advocates and make sure that we are not putting out erroneous information, whether it's good intended intended or not. Right. Which is why I kept my mouth shut because I was like, I don't have, I have have masters, but I don't have all the other. And I didn't feel qualified to speak on it. I, I felt qualified enough to ask people on TikTok what their experiences were. But I definitely didn't, I I didn't do a follow-up because I, every time I went to try to make the connection, to make the, make the video, to make that connection, 
I just thought I'm going to get absolutely slammed for this in the comments and I'm going to get canceled. Congratulations. You didn't get canceled. I didn't do the video. (laughs) I was just thinking about the relief that we hear from our clients after they take their ADHD medication. And I'm starting to think, ah, fuck. We're just feeding the withdrawal of that addiction to our own chemicals. And that is what we're giving ourselves a fix under the pretext that it's what we need rather than the work that is tied to processing and recovering from PTS. Yes. I'm so, I'm having a lot of feelings about this because I'm pissed because that means there's going to be more work both for me professionally and personally, but also it's like an aha moment of holy shit. That makes so much sense because even Gen Xers who were only getting diagnosed with ADHD as adults, perhaps there wasn't the shit to be diagnosed that early on. And so they just think that they got skipped over when in reality, it's only showing up in adulthood after repeated exposure to traumatic events. Son of a... Well, and here's my other thought on that, is it's become very trendy to say that you have ADHD or autism, but... I operate under the belief that nobody is exempt from trauma. And so everybody hears about ADHD and all of the little comorbidities and all of the things. And they're like, me too. I have that too. I do those things. Maybe it's not ADHD. Maybe it's your trauma manifesting in that way. And you just don't recognize it to be that. But to speak to the medication, I was medicated for about seven months. And I was like, my brain can feel, I can do what? Like I, I wrote 30 pages of curriculum in two days and wow, yeah. And then I got pregnant and I was like, oh, I need to. So you did more than just 30 pages of curriculum in those two days. <laughs> <laughs> she did her homework and take home assignment. <laughs> <laughs> that still lives in my home. But yes, but he or he, I'm thinking of my baby now. Mm-hmm. No, I ended up coming off of it. So I had the baby brain on top of it. And then I had postpartum and all of that brain fog. And so I'm just now getting to the place where I feel like I have my brain back. And I have an urge to get my medication back on track. And I'm finding that there are so many natural alternatives that I'm willing to try. And I'm actually working with a mental health nutrition coach who's a certified therapist as well to look into those things. But I have the desire for my brain to feel like that again. But I realize like you, that it's just feeding the machine and it's not, it's not really, it's fabricated. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I want to say this. There has nothing that has been said in the past 15 minutes that we are claiming to be fact. This is all about what if. Isn't that an interesting thing to consider? We don't know. Because we don't know. We've only done the study of our own personal lives and then said, that's an interesting comparison. So we can just go ahead and kick it to the curb that you are completely qualified to talk about your curiosity in this world. And you don't have to have letters behind your name in order to bring up some of these questions that make people ponder and say, "Hmm, maybe I should educate myself a little bit more about ADHD or PTS either way. And so I think it's so fantastic because when we first started this show, we spent a lot of time like, let's talk about your war story. And then I, we're like, why are we even doing that? Because every guest we have on here has a war story. Most of our listeners, 99.99999% have a war story. Oh, because we all have our own. It just might look a little bit different for each person. But it's so important to us to begin to bring you guys in, you first responders in, who now have evolved in your life. And now you're doing wellness coaching. You take on clients. You're I'm going to call you like a circuit speaker. You're 
I've seen you popping around a lot to all these different events. And that's what matters. What matters is, okay, yeah, I went through this really hard shit and it jacked me up and I lost who I was or didn't even know who I was. But here's what it's about. And here's what can be possible. It's inspiring people to see that despite the fact that you chose this career originally and the universe had different plans for you, that you can still be effective, that you can still live this high quality life that maybe even is more serving. I know, brace yourself, than being that first responder, because then it's just there, you're still getting to be that helper Mm -hmm. in a different capacity. And this is probably why I imagine you and Jess Flores. Oh, yeah. Well, we did a g- great episode together. It was fun. Plus, she's, again, our people. She was excited to hear we were talking with you. Oh, yeah. Good. But I love her. It's that same thing of, oh, damn, I hear I thought I lost it all. Yes. And I just realized I just gained everything. Yeah. And I think part of that is being able to peel back all the layers Part of that is getting your body to a place where you feel safe enough to listen to your own internal guidance system. Mm -hmm. I had lost that. I I thought that I couldn't trust myself because, and I won't even blame it on my mental illness, but I was, I was doing things that were, I was betraying my own morals and my own boundaries because I needed that fix. I had reckless behavior because of whatever was going, my body felt reckless. I didn't even feel like I was in my own skin. And so I wrestled with that a lot. And in 2020, when I left my advocacy position, I took a few months off because it was pandemic and I had a baby at home and I was like, let's just see where this goes. Mm -hmm. But I I fell into this kind of uh, negative spiral of I don't have any direction. I don't have any purpose. I don't have any focus. What am I going to do with my life? And I was originally was like, I'm going to, because I'm a yoga instructor and I'm a meditation specialist. So I I do a lot of guided meditations. I was like, I'm going to make an app because this is what we need right now in the pandemic because only 50,000 other people were doing the same thing. But but and there's only one you. I create, I actually created this whole thing. And then I was like, I'm going to do a division for first responders. And I really, was scared to go all in on the first responder thing. But every single time I tried to do just the general yoga thing, there was a roadblock. And I had to start listening to my own discernment and go, okay, this isn't my path. This isn't it. This isn't it. But let me tell you, the first responder thing was scary as hell because it was an expressway. Mm. People were like, yes, give me more. And I was like, I don't have, I don't, have it figured out yet. And it just kept going and going. And before I even had it figured out, I was on three podcasts, just talking about my experience. I just, I had to get over the fear and just take action. And I did. And I stumbled a few times, but I'm here. I've been able to hone it in and dial it in. And it was scary and wonderful. And I'm still like in awe that I'm even sitting here with you all to talk about this stuff and to talk about my own experience because the biggest hurdle to doing just the first responder thing was that I had to share my own story. And when I finally shared my story, people were like, me too. And I was like, oh, really? And it wasn't an outward, you would, you didn't see it in the comments, but my DMs, buddy, they were filled. And I was like, is this real life. And so then that just fueled me. And I knew that was the direction I needed to go. That's your true calling. Mm -hmm. But you had to go through that school of hard knocks. (laughs) Yeah. You had to go through that experience to be able to evolve into your actual purpose, which I'm sure will evolve again because it does. And I just think that it's incredible. And because people like you, because of people like our other guests, It's constantly giving people that permission slip to say, okay, we can do this job. We can have a really effective career and we can get honest about the effects that the job has on us, the effects that it has on our personal life as well, and do something about it in real time versus when it's like a real shit storm to clean up. Yeah. Way too late sometimes. Mm -hmm. While you were talking, AK, I actually thought of a quote 
that one of Aaron and I's friends had posted on her Facebook. So shout out to CP. I'm not going to give her name just in case. But what she said really hit me. And I actually wanted to share it with Aaron privately. And now you've presented this opportunity. But what she said was, trust your gut. Not that it's always right, but you have to start there to learn the difference. And the sooner you start, the better. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I have been asking folks to do is when they have questions or they're not sure, get real quiet, focus in. You already know the answer. Yeah. And when somebody had me do that, my first thought was, fuck. Like literally that word, it came out of my mouth. But working with my clients, doing that same thing, I get the same results as someone got with me. It's we know the answers. Can we slow down, listen to it, push aside the fear, remove that desire momentarily to have somebody else validate what we're thinking to tell us whether we're right or wrong so we don't have to inadvertently make a wrong move or just simply trust ourselves. So I love that as you're talking about being even that meditation specialist, like I've been doing the thing that we learn how to do from Saw and I suck at it. And I am very aware that I suck at it. And I'm also aware that I'm two weeks in and I'm not stopping. Yeah. Because I also am not Tom Brady level quarterback either. So I would need practice and If I give up before it happens for me, then I never get to reap the benefits. Yeah. I love that you have, and maybe you could reiterate this because it's been sprinkled throughout, but can you go through that list again, that bullet point list of the things that you offer up to the people who work with you privately, could potentially follow you on social media? What would be in store for them? So a lot of it is, and truly, I, this is silly, but I make sure that I get, and get, this isn't silly, I get really grounded before I go into session or a speaking engagement or whatever. But so much of what I do just comes through me to the point where I don't even like, I'm like, I don't know where that came from. It came like somebody plucked it out of my subconscious. I don't know. To the point where I have to keep a notebook because I'm like, I've never said that out loud before and I just have to write it down. It's like my subconscious has so many things swirling around and who knows what will come up. But my greatest thing that I can offer somebody else is to listen with my whole heart, like just to give them that space to really just spill it. I'm here for it. You're not going to scare me. You're not going to offend me. I'm not going to judge you. Just let me have it. Right. And then we can pick it apart from there. But really, a lot of the coaching and the speaking engagements and stuff, it's a lot of, I talk a lot about post-traumatic growth. I talk a lot about burnout prevention. And what those things really are is being able to take care of your basic needs, which what a concept. People think it's so dumb. It's so overlooked. It's so undervalued. But if you can take care of your blood sugar regulation, and stay hydrated and get enough sleep and have some decent social connection, like that's going to knock out a lot of stuff for you. All of those things are controllables for your nervous system. So the overall goal is to find some nervous system regulation. And it's not about being regulated all the time because we're freaking human. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to be connected enough to notice when you're dysregulated. And to notice if you're on the high end or the low end, so you can bring it back slowly. And that is not to say that we're doing that to numb out. It's to stay connected. So it's connection over regulation. Because sometimes you have to be dysregulated or I feel like there's no healing in being flatlined. If you're regulated all the time, are you really doing the work? Are you really healing? Are you really blasting through stuff? Are you really processing things? Regulated. Are you really processing things through your nervous system? Or are you just shut down and numbed out? I don't know if that answered your question. or No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But it's a lot of, I I go back and I, a lot of what I do 
too, is educating on ACEs and educating on nervous system regulation and what happens to the brain and the body, because I think there's so much empowerment in just being able to understand what your body is doing as a human. And that knowing and understanding that everything that you're experiencing after having some chronic stress or having some trauma is totally normal and to be expected. So once you do that, you take the shame out of it for people. And then they're like, oh, so you're saying I'm not quite that fucked up. (laughs) And then you're regular. So then we so then we can start to work from there and maybe trace it back to where do you feel like maybe this started? Oftentimes it has nothing to do with a job. Nothing to do with a job. I like to say women don't have daddy issues. They have daddies with issues. Right? Like disconnecting from the ownership of that. Mm -hmm. Right? And why the hell do women get that shitty ass label when they didn't have control over what was happening Mm -hmm. at that point in their life. So that's a stand I've been making lately. I had another question, but similar to Aaron, I just got super excited about what you said and then it flew right out of my head. Oh, I know what it was. See, that's all it takes. So as you are educating folks and talking to them about childhood experiences, I personally would like your experience on working with anyone older than a millennial. So Mm -hmm. Gen X, baby boomers, when we have a difficult time hearing those 10 questions as the little people we were at the time, rather than the adult in front of you. And we've also been conditioned that, yeah, I got a spanking, but I deserved it. Aaron, you remember that parking lot conversation. So how do you break through that wall of denial or mislabeling or minimizing that we see folks doing because they interpret it as I'm saying that you had terrible parents, which that is not where the conversation that actually is irrelevant to the conversation. So I don't focus on it. But that defensiveness of I don't want to be a victim, or Mm -hmm. I don't want to badmouth my parents. Or as an adult, I am very aware that I was loved. And I know that if I was chased home by bullies, and my mom and dad were sitting on the porch, they would have protected me. And not thinking about those moments when mom said, wait till your dad gets home. Mm -hmm. And then dad is the disciplinarian. Mom ain't going to protect you because she's the one that ratted you. And that moment of I am on my own, no one's going to protect me. Even though we know as adults to move through that and get to how we experienced it while we were under the age of 18, I would love your wisdom because I am still going through those walls. And that's my hot topic for the 2024 circuit. So as we know, trauma is nervous system overwhelm. And I just simply ask them to close their eyes and try to remember what their body felt like in that moment. Because I know in moments for me, like I felt I was being abandoned or shamed or whatever the case is, my body did not feel like my own. And I still am like a master dissociator. Like I can zone out into the ether. And (laughs) but I, I remember being able to do that as a kid. And I remember times where I absolutely felt like my heart fell out of my butt. If I can be so frank, because it was a nervous system overwhelm. And if your body felt all of a sudden, like you were in a panic, that was probably traumatic. And so I think educating them on what trauma is and what trauma does to the body and the nervous system, and then equating that back to what did little you feel, not think, 
because your thoughts have been given to you by somebody else. What did little you feel in that moment? Okay. And that's a wrap. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> I totally just in this moment, listening to you two, I'm like, I just visualize this like interesting side project because Cinnamon just touched on it. This is her topic. She has a presentation called Aces in the Hole. She's been traveling all around with first responder conferences. We're going to be in Northern Kentucky at their symposium. She's not speaking at Phoenix Project, but we'll be there talking about Aces. You better believe it. I have New Jersey right before Northern Kentucky. Yeah, that is her presentation. Is educating about Aces. And as you can see, she's experiencing a lot of pushback. But wait a minute, my parents didn't suck. No, we get it. Your parents were doing the best they could with what they had. And it doesn't mean it didn't affect you. So it is super cool. And we had a handful of our guests be in this space of, oh yeah, adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. So it is this like thing that is becoming more readily talked about, I think, in this culture. But yeah, I'm just like, I wonder... If there gets to be this little like side thing with you do. And I've had clients that are much older than myself. I mean, I'm, my oldest client was 62 and the things that bothered him the most and the career that this man had, I can't even, a lot of it he wasn't even supposed, supposed to be talking about, but the things that bothered him the most were the things that happened when he was a child. And he's like, how am I supposed to deal with this? And I said, it's not a matter of dealing with it. It's a matter of processing it and recognizing it for what it was. I just had an epiphany when you said a lot of that stuff he wasn't supposed to be talking about, which I'm making a leap and saying it may be work related. How much of our trauma has had the story around it for whatever reason, we cannot talk about it. We don't talk, we don't feel, we don't share about what happens in our households. And then you go into a job where confidentiality is at its core and you can't talk about it. Or there's the components of the secrecy of FBI, military, like all of that stuff. It's almost like the secret keeping is being replicated in these careers. Holy shit. Okay. I got it. I need, I'm going to need a, a minute to think about all that. Yeah. And then you talk about secrets keep you sick. And then you've got all of this trauma buildup and chronic stress from keeping the secret and maybe even living a double life. You talk about undercover officers. Are you kidding? They have to literally live two lives. And then you look at the premature mortality rate mm. and the autoimmune rate and the cardiovascular disease rates and the rates of stroke and all of these things. And it's really no wonder because it's going to come out in some way, shape or form. Basil Vandercock says it best. It lives in our body. It is alive. It's like yeast. It just lives in there. Mm -hmm. And then it just bubbles up whenever it wants to. And it's going to come out in a physical way, unless you express it through either talking about it or somatic experiencing, which is phenomenal. That's another thing I kind of use with people and being able to let your body cycle through the traumatic experience. If you were in a situation where you wanted to scream, but it wasn't safe to scream, then you let yourself scream. You let yourself complete the cycle. And same goes for fight response. If you wanted to fight and you didn't get to, get on a heavy bag and let yourself complete the cycle. The stress cycle. Have you ever heard of the book Breakdown? No. no. I will give you a copy. No, I'm pretty sure I have oh. an extra one. You got to check okay. it out. It's about the importance of com completing the stress cycle. So my reference for that is Peter Levine's Waking the Tiger. Oh, I have that upstairs too with bookmarks in it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. On our first anniversary of Whole House, we did a month long weekly book giveaway. They had X, Y, and Z, and then they got their name thrown into a drawing on, and we gave away 
Waking the Tiger. We gave away Body Keeps the Score. We gave away Tao of Trauma, like all of these books that time and time again, they come back to. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, what popped into my head was belly fat and high blood pressure medication, right? The you are in this career long enough and you lose maybe that desire or the priority or the time, however you want to frame it to take care of yourself. You get in a 40 hour chair and you start looking different. Mm -hmm. And it's easier. And this can go all the way back to our ADHD conversation. It is easier to pop a pill that you can do in a second than it is to truly take care of yourself. And I think we as an entire culture are guilty of that. I know my mom would prefer to eat pie. (laughs) <laughs> and take a the naughty pie. Well, who wouldn't? Right? right? Yeah. Who wouldn't? Mm-hmm. And yeah. when we can get a sugar rush or dopamine rush from that sugar, like, I wouldn't want to deny myself. That's why I travel with donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone should travel with donuts. <laughs> right? It's best that I don't go into the gas station when I need to refill. Especially There's unsupervised. In your hometown. <laughs> In Danville, where they have all those like fresh pastry, oh. Amish delight, mm. Amishly, Amish baked delight. Da- so Danishes. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm mm. from Knox County. So, AK, I would assume, given where I think you are, not in Aaron's kitchen, but so my parents <laughs> live in Holmes County mm-hmm. and I grew up in Knox. So, right okay. up there in Amish country where everything they make is delicious except their pies. My grandmother made better pies. Oh. But. <laughs> I doubt they're listening. <laughs> that's right. probably pretty like that's that's a safe bet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the idea of somatic experiencing work because I think about even the folks who have you said you don't like to use the word retire and use it only for those who have completed their 25 years. I'm in referring to like medical retirement. Mm-hmm. How much of those somatic like physical symptoms and injuries that they just simply cannot recover from Mm -hmm. are because not only do they keep throwing themselves back into it and not taking the time off that they need to recover, but also the mental strain that is weakening their ability to recover. And even for my folks who end up medically retiring for a physical health issue, I always say, please feel free to ask me for documentation or sign a release for me because your mental state, that's about how this has affected you or how your mental state has affected your physicality. I don't want anyone to not include medical or mental health records regardless of what type of disability it is because I don't know, it's, it was such a terrible idea to separate those two mental and physical health. Mm-hmm. And I think that what happens is we, here we go, it's a stigma. And we hear, I'm, I need a mental health day. And people are like, oh, so you're going crazy? Oh, and, and it's not even, I don't think it, it's even coming from outside anymore. I think it's embedded in us. And so we do it to ourselves. And we're like, I'm not crazy. And it's nobody saying you're crazy. You have a freaking brain injury. Mm-hmm. BTS is a brain injury. It's like a sprained ankle, but like worse than that. <laughs> Along the same. When you said internal, my first thought was like, yes, I definitely think it's coming from the individual, that story of what will others think of me. But I also have noticed that the harshest critics are in the stations and the departments, not civilians observing. We're all on the outside going, oh, hell yeah, that makes total sense. You probably do need a reprieve. And as a civilian, I probably don't want you at work if there's an emergency when you are in need of that time to whatever it is that can get you at least a little bit back to regulated. But I think it is still in the agencies and the departments. I spoke one time and had a chief come tell me, don't ever mention mental health day to my people ever again. (gasps) And my response was, I'm so glad you're not my boss. (laughs) You're not the boss of me. Good for you. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. He's retired now. And it, it's really wild. And I think here's where I get stuck, right? Because I want to be really mad at those people. I want to be like, you're an asshole, mm -hmm. like all the way. But I also see that their rigidity in the way that they think is a byproduct <laughs> of their trauma. <laughs> and being afraid. <laughs> and being afraid. And they're not willing to open themselves up to it because they just don't know what they don't know. And they may never be open to it. And that's okay. And so it, it's, I, I toggle back and forth between wanting to throw a stick in front of their feet while they're walking and wanting to just give them a big old hug and say, I see you. Yeah. And didn't you just, was I, now I'm starting that everything's blending together. <laughs> was it you or Jess? I think it was you that was talking about, Hey, here's the thing. You were basically saying people were like, I'm so sick of this PTS diagnosis. Da, da, da. And, and then you said something along the lines of, if this is like hitting that chord, then oh yeah, perhaps. It, it's an old hillbilly saying, a hit dog will holler. Mm. It means it, it hits something internally to you because you're not going to get offended if it doesn't apply to you. Right. If it doesn't apply to you, you keep scrolling and go, okay. But if it applies to you and it is a threat to your ego then you're going to, you're going to blast me, a stranger on the internet, because why? Because it's a threat. Otherwise, keep scrolling, right? Like it's, it wouldn't be offensive if it didn't hit home in some way. Even thinking about that inability to see the benefit of normalizing, taking your PTO to take care of yourself, where you don't have to get all the way to being physically ill, or it may just be, I want more days off in a row because my body needs it. There's also what we're aware of. There's a staffing shortage. It's the stress of scheduling. It's the stress of mandated overtime. It's the fear of, God forbid, everybody who needs a mental health day takes one off because no one will show up. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a bigger problem. I can totally see what you're talking about in terms of, leadership's response being such as that, because what they're afraid of is the reality of what would happen if they had the liberty to use their PTO in that way. Mm -hmm. And the individual, I find, doesn't want to take the day because they're not comfortable at home. They're more comfortable at work. And so their mental health, they feel feel better at work. Mm -hmm. They feel more alive and it's uncomfortable to not know what to do with yourself on a day off. And so in an effort to avoid the discomfort, I'm just going to go to work where they tell me what to do and I can feel alive. Absolutely. Do you think that this could be connected to voluntary deployments for military right? Let's say mom is, I am done being a single mom. Get home. I'm so sweet. Missed you. The kids don't remember you. Everybody wants you home. And then it's okay. I missed you too, but I have an opportunity to go overseas again and I'm going to take it. And maybe I'll tell you that it's a volunteer or maybe I won't, but either way, I feel more comfortable in a tent than I do in this comfortable, loving household because this makes my skin crawl. Where over there, I feel freedom. It's also about where do you find your worth? If you're at work and you're getting praised for doing a good job and you feel like you have utility, you feel like you're accomplishing something and then you go home and you're like, oh, I'm going to sit in this big comfy chair and my wife's going to be pissed at me because I didn't take the trash out last night. Which one are you going to pick? It's pretty simple. Or I don't know what to do right because if I don't help, it's a problem. But if I do help, they've created a routine in my absence and I might not be doing it the right way. Yes. And it's confusing. So yeah, the expectation is very clear over there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Your barometer is very clear at work. 
your goalposts are very clear and you know where you're making progress, you know where you're hitting the mark, but at home, it's all abstract. It's all vague. And that's actually precisely what I'm in town for is doing presentations on, we're, we're calling it relationship recon. And we're speaking to the group of law enforcement and then we're speaking to the spouses. So we're speaking to them separately, but they're getting the same presentation. And <laughs> Amy Bach's going to be there too, right? Yes. Yeah. And so it's all about communication because we tend to put people in these invisible contracts and then it grows resentment because we expect them to know the thing, but we don't communicate the thing. And then when they don't do the thing, we get pissed. And all of a sudden that morphs into they don't care about what I think. They don't care about what I need. They don't respect me. Mm-hmm. And it's now maybe they, maybe the communication just wasn't clear. Absolutely. And both people in the relationship can have that exact same thought. 100%. Oh. Yeah. And it's funny that one of my things that I do is I'm an integration coach. I work with a lot of our folks. As they get through a certain point of their treatment process, they'll come to me and we'll do some forward thinking stuff. And often couples will end up coming to me and I separate them. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, because the problem is not with your husband or with your wife, their spouse in general. The problem is in you and not the problem, the misunderstanding, (laughs) the miscommunication is within you. And so it's regulating that and understanding that. And so... How fantastic that you're doing this, that you are presenting the same material, which we are also going to be doing that with one of our departments down the road here soon for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. Like you, we can give you the same exact information and it's going to hit you that just the perfect way that it needs to hit you Mm -hmm. for you to heal and grow in your relationship within yourself, your own relationship, your personal relationship with yourself and your partner. Mm -hmm. So that's my biggest thing is. You know, we're quick to focus on what the other person is doing wrong or not doing. And my biggest thing is if you put down the swords, there's no need for the shields. Mm -hmm. Mm. If you stop trying to throw daggers, you don't need to protect your, you're supposed to come together. It's a relationship. It's my, my husband and I, we, (laughs) we've been married seven years, so we've gone through some stuff and we had to come to the conclusion that we are here to make each other better. So iron sharpens iron. So when we start to get, when the daggers come out, we just look at each other and say iron. And when we call a truce, remember, we have to come together and make each other better. We're not coming at each other. We need to come together on the same side of it and and move through the situation. Oh, this girl's a walking bumper sticker. (laughs) <laughs> I know. I'm like, I need that some, should be on a t-shirt. I need some merch. Yeah, girl, you do. I have worked so hard to not write shit down. Twice I've only wrote things down be, uh, three times because I've been keeping my eyes where they're supposed to be. So I'm not in every clip like this. But I did write that down. The idea of if you put down your swords. And I ask clients when the other party comes in, I'm like, okay, so what if I tell you that you're right and the other one is wrong? Does it solve anything? No. (laughs) And they're so adamant. That's what they want from a couple's counselor or a marriage therapist. And I'm like, I can just play any, meeny, miny, mo and make any of you right. And how does that solve the problem? Right. I just say, whoever is right or wrong above my pay grade. That's not what I do. Yeah, because it's not about who's right. It's about coming together and being a united front. Like we we all deal with enough stressors in life as it is. Why come home and create more? But on the flip side of that, I know why is because if you're a first responder, you're primed and conditioned for chaos. And when you come home and things are boring, you're going to poke the bear. That goes right back to ADHD because we don't like boring people. So is it ADHD or is it PTS? Who knows? Or boring shit, as we said on our last episode. <laughs> but here, here's what I want to do. I want to take the opportunity because just like a lot of our folks, we can talk for 20 oh, hours God, and yes. never run out of things to talk. All day. But I want to make sure. What's your favorite color? 
black. It's like, are you a d- dogs or cat? Spirit people find animal. You? Where can we what? find you? How can we hire you as our coach? How can we get you on to speak to our people? This is where you get to shamelessly plug yourself, if you will. And we'll make sure that we have everything on our show notes, of course, so that people can find you. But give us your spiel before it's, we wrap up. It's really not a huge spiel. So I do one-on-one coaching with individuals. I do agency trainings and speaking engagements. And I have a free app called Lifesaver Academy. So you can find my some of my stuff on the app. And there's a free version with a bunch of different grounding techniques and regulation tactics, meditations, if you want to try that out. It's me literally guiding you through meditation. Ton of resources on there. And everything else is all linked up at akdesani.com. If you go there, you can find all my links for all my social accounts and you can put in a request to be on my my one-on-one wait list. You can check out, there's a self-paced program. It's a nine-week program and it's training videos of me walking you through stuff and workbooks. And you could also request information for an agency training or like a keynote situation on there as well. Our girl's on fire, making a difference in the world. The girl is on fire. Thank you. (laughs) See, our whole life is like a soundtrack. I love, you know what? Life is just more fun when it's a musical. That's right. And it's not even intentional. It's just click, I hear, and then, oh, I do the same thing. You go to town. Yeah. Yeah. Except nobody would know my references because I listen to really old country. So nobody would listen. See, I like old country, but when you said Dax and the Joker, I was like, girl is going to the bottom of Spotify. I've never (laughs) heard of that. But I can get down with some, now that you know where I'm from, I can get down with yeah, some. Yeah, some bluegrass and let's just bust out the Ernest Tubb and Lefty Frizzell and like Kitty Wells. I, I'm from Guernsey County originally. So if that gives you any indication. Yep. Friends. Appalachian. All right, my dear, we thank you so much for taking the time with us. We wish you the best of luck on your adventure this weekend in Columbus, Ohio. Thank and obviously always yes we are your friends and got your back however we can support you please let us know thank you Um, so much for having me i this is the first live in real life personal podcast that i've done and this was fun i think a lot of simpatico Mm -hmm. i'm here for it so thank you the audio might suck but we we still got to be together (laughs) thank you for joining us for today's episode of after the tones drop Today's show has been brought to you by Whole House Counseling. As a note, After the Tones Drop is for informational purposes only and does not constitute for medical or psychological advice. It is not a substitute for professional health care advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please contact a local mental health professional in your area if you are in need of any assistance. You can also visit afterthetonesdrop.com and click on our resources tab for an abundance of helpful information. And we would like to give a very special thank you and shout out to Venz Adams, Yeti, and Sonda for our show's music.